really bright lights. Best story sure. of my life. <laughs> Hey, good evening, everybody. I'm Melissa Andrews, along with lead investigator Brian Duggar tonight. We're bringing you something very interesting and quite impactful to our area. Um, if you're a fan of those true crime podcasts or if you like to follow crime at all, did you know that Toledo has our own history of major crimes? And tonight we're talking about your investigation into some local serial killers. Yeah, the Cook brothers back in 1980 and 1981, they killed at least 10 people that we know of, and clearly it's like the darkest period of Toledo criminal history. Yeah, I know that this story really came out um, in 2018 when one of the brothers was released, but if someone's watching for the first time on Facebook Live, shocked to hear that we had our own serial killers, tell us what happened 40 years ago. Yeah, so in May of 1980, Nathaniel and Anthony Cook, they abducted Sandra Pagorski and her boyfriend, Tommy Gordon, um, from they were sitting out in front of their Toledo home. They abducted them. They took them to Western Toledo, um, and they, they raped Sandra. And Tommy had gotten away, and he, they ended up shooting him. So that was really the start of this whole thing. So beginning in May of 1980, you know, I think the next killing was in January of 1981, but at that point they really picked up in frequency. They were night stalkers. So basically, you know, at night they were, they were stalking uh, white couples because there was definitely a racial component mm -hmm. to it. I mean, Anthony admitted that he was in prison previously for an armed robbery and he, the white guard treated him badly. And he wrote several letters to his brother where he said, you know, the white man is the enemy. And so there's definitely a racial component. And so young white couples were targeted over a 16 month period. So interesting how he kind of twisted that in his mind to go after mm -hmm. these young white couples. And I believe there was even a young girl that was uh, one of the victims as well. Yeah, that is the one that, I mean, obviously any death is devastating to the family and their friends, but 12 year old Don Backus, it was absolutely brutal. Um, they, Anthony actually kidnapped her off the street as she was walking near the University of Toledo. He basically stalked her. He saw she was turning down her street where she lived. He went to the next street, cut in front of her, waited for her, then got behind her, kidnapped her, and then took her to where his brother was in an apartment. And then they took her to the abandoned state theater, which is now demolished um, on Collingwood Boulevard brutally raped her, murdered her. I mean, it's, it, it's awful. We have our uh, Facebook Live up right now, and I'm trying to see if we have any, here we go, if we have any questions coming in, just let us know and we'll pull those up and try to answer those with Brian here about his investigation tonight. Um, so far I'm not seeing any, but I don't know if I'm doing this correctly, so let me know here. We've got our web department standing by. But when you started to investigate this, I mean, this is kind of the 40th um, anniversary of this mm -hmm. this killing spree. What do you think um, captivates Toledo most about this, and what interested you most about this? Well, it really, <laughs> sorry, someone's trying to help us out here, but to me, I mean, I got to Toledo in 1998, and that's where basically this case, they were both convicted in 1998. So at that point, I, I definitely knew about it. It was a big deal. It's not often in Toledo that you no. get truly cold-blooded killers. And not just killers, but serial killers. I mean, these were some of the highest numbers of people that they killed of any serial killer in the United States. I mean, certainly there were more, but, you know, 10 people is a lot. So when we really looked at it, we, we recognized that it, May is the 40-year anniversary of it. And we understand that um, some people, including family members, they're like, oh, we keep bringing this up. You know, there have been so many stories done about this. But me as a journalist, as a 40 year anniversary, I wanted to do, I wanted to document it in a really good way. And I also believe that I could get some of the family members and survivors mm -hmm. to participate. So there were actually a couple of survivors that mm -hmm. are in our stories over the next two nights 
who told their story for the first time. Yeah, and that's very critical to mm -hmm. uh, the investigations that you have coming out. Also just want to mention to you guys right now, you can text us the word crime to 248-1100 and we'll send you all the backstory because mm -hmm. there is a lot. Um, exclusive digital photos. You've put together a nice mm -hmm. uh, presentation on mm -hmm. digital for our viewers. Yeah, it's really, I mean, there's just so much when you're talking about 10 different crime scenes. There's so much to try to fit in over a two night period, so. And you know, uh, I sent you a message today about this whole thing, and the way that you put it was that these brothers, specifically Nathaniel, who's now out on the streets, which blows your mind anyway, that this guy was convicted, correct, of four rapes, four murders, and he's out on the streets of Toledo, and they think that he could have done more? Well, that's actually, interestingly, he was convicted of aggravated, Let's see, let me think about this. So he's convicted of two kidnapping counts and attempted aggravated murder. Mm -hmm. So they actually never convicted him of murder itself. But they knew that these brothers were responsible probably yeah, for all these crimes. Yeah, because you said that he mm -hmm. definitely participated in the, the raping the and killing four, of, yeah. the, of the little girl and the couple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they knew that they were involved in all these cases, but at that point, DNA wasn't like it is now. It was difficult to use the DNA from 1980, and honestly, they killed their witnesses. There weren't witnesses. Right. So it's going to be very hard for them to get convictions in that, that case. So the prosecutor and the police, they said, we want to at least bring closure mm -hmm. to the family. So we'll give them a deal. They admit to everything that they did, and we will let Nathaniel out in 20 years. Now this is the hot button issue I think for Toledoans and this is what people are reacting to right now on the Facebook page. There's lots of questions of course about this very issue which is it doesn't seem to make sense to people to be quite honest and here's uh, Andrea Smith says he should have gotten life. Law enforcement works their butts off solving these crimes and risking their lives. Lawyers set these evil criminals free. Um, Daniel says why didn't they get life? Why was uh, Nick Duggar says why was Nathaniel given such a short sentence mm -hmm. compared to his brother's sentence? And I think that's the big question is and I've heard that um, the prosecutor Julia Bates is still upset to this day about this deal that was given but at the time some of the families supported a deal is that right? Yeah they went to all the families and they said this is what we want to do. Are you comfortable with that? And the families of the victims, of the actual victims, not the survivors, but of the actual victims, they all agreed to it. And Sharon Wright, who is the mother of Don Backus, a 12 year old, you know, she told me and she was very emotional about it. She said, it feels like I betrayed my daughter because we believed over a 20 year period that they would find something else. And the fact of the matter is, if they find anything else, Nathaniel will never get out of prison. He'll be in prison for another 75 years. But Mel, something else really interesting about this time period, they committed these crimes in 1980 to 81. So at that point, Ohio, the U.S. Supreme Court had stepped in and ruled the death penalty illegal in Ohio. So there's a four year period until November of 1981, when they were done with their killings, there was a four year period where they were not eligible for the death penalty. And the way the sentencing laws were, they could not run the sentences consecutively. They had to run it concurrently. And that meant, so the people that were shot and killed, they would not be able to give them longer than that 20 years. Mm -hmm. The most they were gonna get was 20 years. So they never prosecuted those cases. So a lot of these people never got their day in court. The interesting thing too is that Nathaniel Cook is now out. I, I wanna save for your investigation at 11, so I don't wanna give too much away, but you paid him a visit and we're gonna see too. that at 11 o'clock. Give us kind of just a, an insight if you can, not too much about how he's living. Um, He's, is he a registered sex offender? He is a registered sex offender, yeah. and that's actually how I found his address, mm -hmm. because as a registered sex offender, he, he's got to register every, mm -hmm. I don't know what it is, 30 days maybe. Mm -hmm. So his address is on there, the Ohio Sex Offender Registry. And I sent him a, 
a letter about a week beforehand because I didn't want to just show up on yeah. this porch. Well, it and I know. Right. And the really funny thing about this is when I did eventually go to his porch, his mom was there and she invited me inside. And I'm like, uh, no thanks, I'll wait out yeah. here on the porch. Well, someone's but. asking uh, Carla, where is Nathaniel living and is he monitored? He is being monitored and actually the um, lead detective in this case He's obviously retired now. He's 81 years old, Frank Stiles. Um, when I told him about the fact that I went to see Nathaniel, he asked me that very question. He's on West Central Avenue. Um, he asked me, and I told him where he's living, and he actually put a call in the police department. And I'm sure they're aware of it anyhow, but mm -hmm. he said, I need you guys to mm -hmm. keep a close eye on this guy. Does the name Cynthia Anderson ring a bell? There's a couple people here who say mm -hmm. they think that he may have had something to do with that case. Have you gotten to dig into that at all? Does that name sound yeah. familiar? Yeah, Cynthia Anderson was actually one of the people that uh, the Cook brothers were questioned about because they did believe. I mean, she was a young white woman and it was right in the area where a lot mm -hmm. of these uh, murders happened. So it was in the area they thought they could have possibly been suspects. However, she did not fit the M.O. because Cynthia disappeared during the middle of the day mm -hmm. from work. That doesn't make sense. And you the said Cook, they were night stalkers. Cook brothers were night stalkers, and they, but they did ask them about her. And they were very honest about the other thing. Part of their plea deal, it was, you, we will, if you tell us every murder you did, we will not charge you with those murders. I mean, so that was the deal. But you need to tell us. And if you're dishonest, if there's one you don't tell us about and we find out about it, that's it. The deal is off. So don't they think that these guys still could have been in, um, responsible for even more murders out there? Do they believe that they did get the full truth? They don't because uh, the deal was they had to talk about all the murders they committed in Lucas County. Now, these guys were long haul truckers, which meant that they traveled to Illinois, Indiana, down south into Tennessee, Kentucky places like that and they did not have to confess to those crimes and Anthony Cook regularly told his his buddy he, he would brag about picking up hitchhikers while he was out mm -hmm. and he'd be gone for like a week at a time he would talk about picking up hitchhikers and I don't think he ever told his buddy what he did with them but it's very hard for me to believe and for the police to believe that he would pick up hitchhikers and just mm -hmm. let them go I mean, there were several women that Anthony admitted to raping. One woman he raped, and then he had a very nice conversation with her. So he decided to let her go. So, wow. you know, maybe... It's really prolific. Do you think that, <laughs> obviously, it's all, it, it all seems that Anthony is this terrible, evil mastermind, mm -hmm. and you don't want to give Nathaniel a pass at all. You don't want to... He obviously needs to take responsibility for all of the horrible things that he's done. Do you think there was this relationship in which Anthony was extremely dominant over Nathaniel or how he seemed to have done far more yeah. than Nathaniel? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Anthony was nine years older than Nathaniel and at that point the father was no longer in the family and you know they looked up to Nathaniel looked up to Anthony as a father figure no doubt about it, he wanted to please Anthony. Um, Anthony was in prison for six years for armed robbery um, from 1973 to 1979, late 1979. And during that time, Nathaniel did not commit any crimes. There may have been a minor drug offense, mm -hmm. but he did not do anything. And then as soon as Anthony got out, you know, the beginning of 1980, that's when the crime spree started. And Nathaniel admitted well, he admitted to three murders, but they believe for sure that he did at least four. But after those first four, he he just stopped doing that. He didn't want to participate anymore. And that was okay with Anthony. Yeah, and Anthony just kind of did his thing on his own. And, um, you know, and after that point, let's make this point also that Anthony was convicted of killing Peter Sawicki in September of 1981. Now, they were not able to get Nathaniel on anything until 19 or 2000 and 
just here a blank there, or 1997. Mm -hmm. At that point, DNA came back, and they had found DNA with the Sandra Fagorski case, and that DNA matched Anthony and Nathaniel. So Nathaniel was out in the street from 1981 till 1997. He did nothing. Mm. There's no criminal mm -hmm. record. And in fact, I believe he was working for a uh, senior citizen's home. He would drive seniors between. He kind of just turned it on and off based on if Anthony was around to influence him. Right. But let's make this point completely mm -hmm. clear. Yeah, he did not do anything after those first four, but the ones that he participated in, absolutely vicious. The Bacchus killing, absolutely. He was almost did worse than Anthony. The stuff that, that you read about was some of the most prolific serial killers that, you know, make national news all over the place that books mm -hmm. are written about. We're talking about the same kind of activity here. Want to update you with a couple more questions. And again, if you guys uh, want to talk with us, we're on Facebook Live. We're going to be going through some of these questions leading up to our investigation, which airs tonight at 11 with Brian Duggar. It's a revisit of the Cook Brothers case, prolific serial killers. Uh, from the Toledo area. It is the 40th anniversary, so that's why we're doing this. Also, uh, so put your questions here on Facebook Live. Also, uh, we can text you the whole backstory. We've got some exclusive digital content and photos. And if you just text the word crime to 419 248 1100, we'll send that right to your cell phone. So that's a great thing. Okay, let's get to some of these uh, questions here. Uh, Carla wants to know how does he support himself? Uh, these days is he on state or federal assistance does is he on parole or probation well that's a good question because as part of his probation he's required to keep a job and he has had several jobs however the victims families once they find out where he's working they have immediately notified you know understandably so they've mm -hmm. immediately notified the bosses and said hey do you realize that you have a serial killer working for you and there's at least one case I know of where Nathaniel was um, taken out with an armed, armed guard from mm -hmm. the job after he was fired. So at this point, I, I did hear that once the weather warms up, he's supposed to get some type of construction job. Mm -hmm. But at this point, as far as I know, he's not working. It would really have to take a person who is willing to put faith in a rehabilitation mm -hmm. style of work relationship and who really believes that someone deserves another chance like this in yeah. order to employ him I'm sure and you know what a member of the Cook family who would not identify himself he actually called me earlier this afternoon and he said do you know what you're doing to the Cook family by bringing this up mm -hmm. and I started thinking of that I mean Nathaniel and Anthony they did have nine brothers and sisters and it was a religious family for the most part when I went to visit Nathaniel, who's living with his mom, there's a Jesus sign next to the door. Is this, what his mom put up? His mom was very religious. Many members of the family are very religious. Um, and these people are victims too. And this family member that I talked to, he said, look, we have absolute compassion and sympathy for the victims and the families. What these guys did was absolutely horrible. We don't condone that. But we want you to understand that people have been making death threats against us. There's like mm -hmm. nephews and nieces who weren't even alive during this time period that, I mean, they're having a hard time going mm -hmm. on with their life. And do you get the impression that anyone other than the mother maintains a relationship with Nathaniel? I don't know that. I haven't heard that, but, this, but they must because the guy that called in today, and again, he did not identify himself, mm -hmm. he said, look, Nathaniel is very remorseful for what he did. He understands he did many bad things when he was a 21 year old or 20, whatever he was. And he feels bad about that, but he just wants to get on with his life. He served the time that the state gave him. 20 I'm gonna years. be the advocate for these people on Facebook probably and say, of course you would wanna get on it with your life, mm -hmm. but you took other lives. And you know, that's, that's probably what has created such uh, disgust in the Toledo area mm. for the fact that Nathaniel is out because is that something that you can ever really just move on from? Certainly right. those families of those victims cannot. It was difficult to hear him say, I'm just trying to get on with my life. Yeah. It was very difficult for me to hear him say that. Right. And think they about, don't have the chance to do that. Right. The victims or their families. Right. And think about this, Mel. 
during the time period, again, when they committed these crimes, the death penalty wasn't an option. For killing a 12-year-old girl like they did, if they could have convicted them on that offense during that time, they would have received the death penalty. And 40 years later, there's a good chance they may have been executed by this point. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult to listen to someone say, well, I just want to get on to my, with my life. Mike Reardon is asking, as a result of being charged, convicted, and sentenced by our criminal justice system, is there any change in the safety of society when they're released, or is the only safety for the short time that they're incarcerated? Any interventions that have shown any success? I emailed you about this today. Yeah, right. Um, we have a violent offender registry mm -hmm. now in Ohio, and that's from another local murder case of Sierra Joggin. This does not apply to these brothers, to mm -hmm. Nathaniel, because this law was passed when he was already released. But certainly people with violent offender histories would now have to register. So you would right. be able to go to your local sheriff's office and look up that information. Mm -hmm. But similar to a sex offender registry, you still have to, I guess, you know, be aware that those people are there. and. Yeah. You know, it's one more tool, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I've seen several comments on Facebook. I mean, people know where this guy is. I mean, he's, his address is right there in the sex offender registry. And, you know, some of the commenters have been like, yeah, he lives right down the street from me. Um, Which is not too far from where they committed these crimes either. No, that was shocking to me, actually, when I went to look at where the old State Theater was in Collingwood Boulevard. I mean, it really is only a couple years away and, or a couple miles away. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that was troubling to me a lot is that um, Nathaniel was driving a black pickup truck. The Cook brothers committed all their killings with a pickup truck. And except for the last one when Anthony used his wife's car mm -hmm. to kill Peter Sawicki. Didn't know he was married. Yeah. No. Um, and tell us about um, someone uh, Frank Stiles, is that the detective? Yeah. He wrote a book. He did, The Evil Brothers, and he's no longer selling that book. However, it's available in all the local libraries, and it, it really was crucial in this investigation because, you know, he's a detective who took very detailed notes. So, I mean, it was very thorough. So you want to wow. know exactly what happened with every crime, not only during the investigative part, but the part where they actually confessed. I mean, he's got yeah. detailed notes about what they said in the confession, and they didn't hide it in the confession. They both were interviewed separately. They both gave identical stories, mm -hmm. and they were brutally honest. So the book is called Evil Brothers by Frank Stiles, and you yep. can get that at the Lucas County Library. Any, yeah, yep. How did they, um, and I, I could talk about this all night, we're not gonna do that, <laughs> we're gonna leave a lot for the 11, but I do wanna know, how did they eventually identify these guys? Well, in 1981, Anthony was, you know, he had abducted Leslie Sawicki and Todd Sabo, and Todd Sabo was a very prominent University of Toledo wrestler. He abducted them, they were sitting in their van outside an apartment, they got out of the van, he abducted them, forced them back into the van, tied them up, uh, wanted to rape Leslie, but they got away. Um, and basically, Leslie ran in to call the police. Todd held the gun on Anthony. Leslie's father, Peter, showed up, obviously very irate that this person was trying to rape mm -hmm. his daughter. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a fight broke out. Um, during the fight, Anthony got the gun back. He ended up shooting and killing Peter Sawicki and shot Todd Sabo. However, Todd Sabo and Leslie Sawicki were very good witnesses on the stand. Mm -hmm. And so he was convicted in 1981. And then interestingly, Julia Bates had gone to a conference where she heard about Dr. Sam Shepard from Bay Village. Where they Very had, familiar. I'm from that area. Yes, mm -hmm. where they had used DNA to kind of clear him. And uh, Mrs. Bates came back and she called Frank up and said, is there any DNA that we can test? And again, back in the 80s, they didn't really know how to preserve the DNA, but they did have a viable DNA sample from the Sander Fagorski case, which was the very first rape and mm -hmm. killing. So they were able to use that and they already had 
um, Anthony in prison, so they're able to match up that DNA. Nathaniel had been identified by Sandra Pogorski at that time as her attacker, so they brought him into custody, got a DNA sample, and were able to match that up. It's really fascinating, and mm -hmm. you are going to have much more on this tonight mm -hmm. at 11 and then tomorrow night as well because it's just too much to pack into one story. I see more questions coming in here on our Facebook Live, so I'm going to leave Brian to answer those for you. Be sure to join us tonight at 11, and of course, again, if you would like to get the full backstory of the Cook brothers and their serial killing spree 40 years ago now, and that's why we're doing this, uh, you can text 419-248-1100. Uh, the word crime text us that mm -hmm. word and we'll send you all that content thanks so much yeah Ryan. yeah and again i mean send me questions i can't answer them all right now but i will go on facebook after this and try to answer as many as i can all right we'll see you tonight at 11. thanks guys